Okay, so last time, um, oh, let me, before we start, let me, let me ask, are you guys, you know, did you guys finish your exam? Are you doing okay with that? Um, did most of you already take it, I, I assume? Yes, 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 took mine yesterday. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for bearing with us as we kind of work out for the first time how to do an online exam. I know maybe that was, you know, less than ideal. And uh, we tried, I, I felt it went really well. We did it yesterday. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Um, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, I was trying to, you know, trying to make an effort to, to make sure that this was as least awful as possible. And I hope that we, we got somewhere near that goal um, with that. Dawn put a ton, a ton, a ton, ton of work into that. And, and I did too. And I hope, it, I hope it was not so terrible for you. The extra time was useful. Yeah, that was something that we didn't realize until very late was that, you know, it was gonna be a little bit stressful and difficult to upload stuff. So, yep. I'm glad the extra time helped out. Okay, so let's let's get started. Um, what I am going to do today, I hope, is in the standard in the standard textbook, something like chapters 21.1 to 21.8, or I'm sorry, 21.1 to 21.4, and by the end of the week, we'll be up to to finishing this chapter, which is 21.8. Um, please do read along at home, and you know this is. This is where the, a lot of people start to struggle with this course. So, you know, potential is a kind of an abstract uh, concept and it will help you tremendously if you read the book. Um, with that being said, I will do my very best to explain it to you verbally and, and with notes here, but you should, you know, I, I do encourage you to get that basis in the textbook. It's, it's, it's um, very helpful. So, Last time we introduced this idea of electrical potential energy, um, and it's just defined as we have this electrical potential energy, um, the charge Q. I'm using a different symbol today for Q. This little line in there is to try to discriminate this from a nine so that you're not confused with, you know, nano coulombs or 10 to the minus 19s or something like that. Uh, it's a weird Q, but, you know, if, if I tell you now that this is a charge Q, hopefully um, it won't be too confusing. And then because we have a couple different V's in our life, I'm using this big V with, you know, two lines on the top to signify the potential. And the potential, you know, is a new quantity that we're trying to get more of an intuitive idea of today. Um, the potential is the units of it are volts. And you can think of this in your mind, in the back of your mind, we're getting the batteries and circuits next week. And really this potential we're gonna draw uh, on very strongly when we talk about voltage and you know, potential differences in circuits, stuff like that. Today will be a little bit abstract, but very, very, very soon we will get you know, the concrete example of, of batteries and flowing currents and stuff like that. So I, I hope we'll be uh, grounded very shortly on this. The thing I tried to get across last time, and I will hammer, hammer again today, is this idea that all that matters is differences in potential. So this is our, def our definition of potential and potential energy. And really what's gonna matter in this is differences. So delta U, delta V, delta is the Greek symbol for change. So change in potential energy is equal to Q times change in potential. These two quantities, the potential energy and the potential, are, are so closely linked. It's just this little factor of Q. It's easy to get them confused, but you have to really listen to the context of the problem um, when, when, when we're talking about this. Over here, this is the potential. This is the potential energy. I know, it's terrible, but it, it is what it is. That's the, that's the nomenclature that we use. The thing that I'm trying to hammer home right now with my strangely tilted text is just like with gravitational potential energy, the specific value at some point, the specific value of this big V, the number that's associated with it is not so important. What's really important is if I have some value of potential at some region of space and I have another value of potential some other region in space, it's the difference in potential that is going to be very important 
and that will lead to you know the movement of charge and the the um, exertion of a of a force. So it's it's really what we're what we're interested in is will the potential increase or decrease if we move from one spot in space to another spot in space, like from the positive um, terminal of a battery to the negative terminal of a battery or something something like that. The other thing that I introduced was this idea of an electron volt. Um, an electron volt is the change in energy of an electron when it moves through a one volt potential difference, right? That's a mouthful, but it's basically if you think of, you know, an apple falling from the top of Demerit Hall to the, to the bottom of Demerit Hall, we could define that change in energy as a unit called the Demerit. I don't know, we could make something up. Same idea here, if an electron moves through a one volt potential difference, this is how much its potential energy is going to change. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny number, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. That 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 pops up a lot because it's also the value of the fundamental charge of an electron, at least it's the absolute value of it, it's the fundamental charge of a proton as well. So this number 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, that's the charge. If we look at how much that charge gains or loses energy as it moves through a one volt potential difference, that's equal to you know that charge times that voltage, which is gonna come out in SI units, joules, one electron volt. Again, this is no different from back in, in thermodynamics, you know, early part of the course, when we were talking about redefining uh, 4.19 joules as one calorie, or 12 eggs is equal to one dozen, or something like that. It's just a rescaling, because 10 to the minus 19 is terrible to carry around in your calculations and punch into your calculator. And if we redefine that as a single unit of energy, um, it's, just, it's just helpful so that we don't have to carry around these weird exponents. Okay, so that's you know my five minute review of what we did last time. Let's move into some new, some new concepts here. So please focus on the left hand side here. What I'm, what I'm showing is a battery that um, creates a potential difference between a parallel capacitor plate um, here and here. And let's say this battery creates a 300 volt potential here and a negative 200 volt potential here. I understand, you know, I'm, I'm using this, I'm using this concept of voltage before we really dug into it, but also, hey, you've seen a battery and it creates a potential difference. And I hope this isn't too big of a stretch in your mind. Um, I'm not gonna pretend that you've never seen um, voltages in your life before. By the same token, I know you're not electrical engineers and I'm not assuming that you know more than, than just you know, everyday knowledge of, 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 of voltage differences. So if I have this plus 300 volts and this minus 200 volts, and I have a point charge um, here at location A, point A, the value of the charge is plus 15 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs, what's gonna happen? Well, that positive charge is going to want to get away from that positive 300 volt potential and get closer to the negative, the lower potential actually, which is more important. It wants to get from this high potential to this low potential in the same way that an apple held over the edge of Demerit Hall wants to get from that high gravitational potential to a lower gravitational potential energy um, at the, at the, on the ground. So if I let this go some instant later, this 15 times 10 to the negative nine uh, coulombs is going to fall, quote unquote, it's going to experience an electrical force and, and, and be impelled or compelled to go from that plus 300 volts to that negative 200 volt point. Um, in that process, what happens? We've had a change in potential energy, and I wanna look at what that change in potential energy is. Well, the first thing I need to do is figure out what's the change in the potential. The potential is this big V. So I look at my V final minus my V initial. My V final was negative 200 volts. My V initial was plus 300 volts. So I just take the difference here and I get minus 200 volts. This V is just signifying <coughs> the SI unit of voltage, which is of the volt. Um, and I get negative 500 V, 500 volts. 
this is my change in potential. What I want is to figure out what is the change in potential energy. And the change in potential energy is going to be just this times the value of that charge. The charge in this space, we have a potential set up by this battery and we have a charge in this space between the capacitor plates. The value of that charge is 15 nanocoulombs on this point charge here. So I put that in here, plus 15 times 10 to the negative nine coulombs, multiplied that by my delta V, my change in potential, and that's negative 500. And I get negative 7.5 times 10 to the negative six joules. Okay, so if I wanna be, you know, get a little bit of a more compact notation, this 10 to the minus six, SI prefix is gonna be a micro, it's a Greek symbol mu. This is the same, this is two ways of writing the same thing, micro joules or 10 to the minus six joules. So what, did ha what happened here? We had a change in the potential energy of this 15 nanocoulomb charge moving from this point to that point. And it's negative. So that negative, you know, delta U in this situation, delta U is negative, it's less than zero. So we have lost potential energy, not we, the charge Q has lost potential energy in this falling, quote unquote, from this point to that point. In this movement from point A to point B, it has lost potential energy. Where can that go? Energy is conserved. We are still following that basic tenet that the law of conservation of energy. So that energy has to go into the kinetic energy of that charge. So that kinet, that that 15 nanocoulomb charge gains kinetic energy. This is, you know, this is still true from your last semester. The kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So all that potential energy that it had when it was close to the plus 300 volt plate gets converted into kinetic energy as it reaches the, the negative 200 volt um, potential plate. And that gets converted into a kinetic energy one half mv squared. Now in this problem, I did not give you the mass of this 15 nanocoulomb uh, charge. I never told you the mass. But if I gave you the mass, then if you figured out that change in potential energy, you could figure out how much the kinetic energy increased and you could peel out the velocity of that charge as it reached that second plate. Very similar to the problem that we, we went through last time. But the point here is we figured out the change in, in potential, we figured out the change in potential energy, and we've also figured out how much this would impact the kinetic energy of this charge as, as, we, as we went through this motion, or as the charge, I should, I should be more careful, as the charge goes through this motion. So, um, now I mentioned in the beginning of the, of the class that I wanted to hammer home that the specific value of the potential at any point in space is not very important. It's actually the differences in potential that, that matter. So I want you to consider if we had, you know, this is my badly drawn batteries right here. So we have three different situations here. The first one is, hey, I have a battery that creates 500 volts here and zero volts here, or I have a battery that creates 2,500 volts here and 2,000 volts here. Or even weirdly, I have a battery that creates two negative potentials, negative 1,000 and negative 1,500 volts here. All of those, if you go and, and calculate, calculate this um, V final minus V initial, you're always going to get negative 500 volts. And the value of the charge doesn't change. So this problem is identical. It's absolutely identical mathematically even though these values of the potential at each of these points is much different. The, the difference here is 500 volts, the difference here is 500 volts, the difference here is 500 volts. It's always 500 volts less, negative 500 volts, going from that plate to that plate. So with that, you would get, you know, all would have the exact same change in potential, all would have the exact same change in potential energy. Physically, it's in, you know, you cannot discriminate between these four cases. They're all the same. And this hopefully gives a little bit more grounding to the statement that I put out here that 
only changes in potential um, make any have any significant meaning in in nature. Does that you know? Let me pause here. Does that kind of seem okay? Do you have any objections to that? Do you have any questions about that? I'll just pause for a moment. Okay, I get um, nothing from the audience, so let me move on. Um, and then just just kind of, I, I get it, Olivia Rose, awesome, thank you, Olivia, thank you for, for that. That is, I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to belabor this, Olivia, but this is a very subtle point, and one that I quite honestly did not get when I was a student, and I congratulate you for getting it, so good. Um, and if anybody else doesn't get it, there's no shame in that. And please do kind of go back over this notes or ask me a question. Um, nothing wrong with not getting it. And if you're not getting it, I'm not doing my job. It's my fault, not yours. So um, all these would have the same change in potential energy. Um, only differences in potential energy. I'm just kind of, this is written down exactly what I just said. Um, only changes in potential energy are significant. And because of this, we can set the potential equals zero anywhere convenient. So in this case here, I chose somewhere convenient. This, I could set this equal to zero um, because that just kind of makes my life easy. This is a zero, this is a 500, and I can put this as my reference point. But I can do this, you know, I can do this wherever I want. I can set the potential equal zero wherever I want <coughs> because only those changes uh, make a difference. Now, one other interesting point here is if we had a negative charge, very same situation, I have the same situation as I started with, um, sorry for scrolling back here, but if I started here with a negative charge instead of a positive charge, then maybe I have a picture of this coming up. Let's see if I do, um, yeah, here it is. So if I have a negative charge and it's going from that and I've redefined the scale so it's from zero to 500 because who cares, it's just simpler this way. Um, my initial situation is I have the negative charge here near the higher potential and in the final situation it's at a lower potential. Well, this negative charge, because I flipped the sign on, on this charge, instead of falling, falling like the apple going down outside the Merritt Hall from the, from the top, falling, you would actually have to push it from that higher potential to the negative potential. That negative sign um, switches everything around. And let's see if we can see that mathematically. Hopefully you see that kind of graphically, that going from here to there, because this is negative, I'm going from higher potential to lower, and I have to push it to get down here instead of letting it fall. Let's look at if the, what the math tells us here. So everything is the same. We still have a negative 500 volt potential difference. I've lost 500 volts going from the top to the bottom. But I introduced this negative symbol here um, in my charge because it's a negative 15 nanocoulombs. All that does is this negative and this negative cancels out and I get a plus here. Well, what does that mean? It means my change in potential energy is positive. I've gained potential energy as I've moved from point A to point B. You know, the only way that I gain is if I actually have done work and I've forced it to go from that, that, that point to here. This is the, you know, this is the analog of I take my apple at the, on the ground floor of demerit and I carry it up to the, the top of demerit. I'm doing work on it against the gravitational force. Here, again, this is a kind of a trick that you have to, you have to be able to flip back and forth and I know it's awkward at first, but I, I, do, I do guarantee that if you think about it long enough, this will become kind of intuitive to you. We can think about a potential difference between these two plates, or we can think about an electric field between these two plates, or we can think about an electric force between these two plates. They're all just different angles of looking at the same exact phenomenon. And if I'm moving from this point to that point, there's an electric force that's opposing that and I really have to work, I have to work to get from that higher potential to that, to that lower potential because of the negative. So, so I hope that that, you know, this is another super simple math, right? You're just multiplying two numbers here, but the actual physical content of what this means is, is actually quite subtle. So I do encourage you, 
you know, just try to chew on this a little bit and make sure you digest it. And if you can get this, it really will help as we get into more and more complicated problems. Um, and if you have a question, I'm happy to, happy to answer it if, if you have any. Okay, let me try, um, let me try our, our, our white whale in, the, in this online course has been pulling. I have not yet been able to pull you on anything and it's killing me. Um, let me try to ask you a question in the polls. Um, so Olivia tells us that she gets it. I'm gonna ask you guys, uh, do you get it? Uh, yes, no. Okay, can you guys see a poll? Let's see, I'm gonna launch a poll. Um, yes, six, eight, nine, ten, seventeen. Hey, we did a poll. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you for doing that. That gives me some hope that we can somehow do a clicker problem again someday. Um, 28 out of 34, and then we got six people who are just haven't had their coffee yet and don't want to commit. That's okay. That's fine. Um, thanks. That really makes me feel better. I don't know what. So I got some new bugs in, in, in Zoom, and we got rid of some old bugs. And I think I, I'm sharing, sharing the results. 29 out of 29, you get it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, all right. So this brings us to our next question, which I hope occurs to your mind. Okay, we're, we're, you know, we have this potential. How do, you, how do you create a potential in the first place? And why, you know, where does the potential come from? The answer to this is, you know, if we go back to, to the very first lecture that we had when we started talking about um, Coulomb forces and charge forces, the natural state of our universe is, uh, you know, and this is true from as far as we know from the Big Bang until now, is this completely harmonious, perfect balancing of positive and negative charges in, in the universe. So that it's very rare to find circumstances where there's an imbalance of positive and negative charges. Um, super, super interesting fact, like why is that true in the first place? And that's a whole nother lecture, a whole nother course that we could go into. But the basic truth is in the universe that we find ourselves, the positive and negative charges, um, for whatever reason, are, are almost perfectly balanced to, you know, to parts per million level. So a potential difference comes along when, or happens when you come along and you do something to break that harmony or break that symmetry and separate positive and negative charges and create a separation of charges that creates a potential uh, or a potential difference because it's an unnatural situation and we've separated those positive and negative charges. We know that Coulomb's law tells us they just want to get back together again. Um, so you're going to create some kind of interesting situation by doing that. And that sounds very abstract. So let me just show you a couple of examples here. I have a capacitor. And I hope, I hope that you guys are seeing that I'm posting these notes beforehand on, on, on Canvas so that hopefully, you know, if I'm talking too fast or whatever, you don't have to write down or draw the, the terrible things that I, you know, the pictures that I draw. Um, you already have a, your home version of the terrible pictures that I, I draw. So we have a capacitor. And in this one, we have this simple situation where we've, we've put a positive, a plethora of positive charge on the top plate, and we've put a abundance of negative charge equal and opposite um, magnitude on the bottom plate. This is going to create a potential difference. We've thought about this in terms of electric field. We know that this creates a very beautiful, um, very beautiful uniform electric field going from positive to negative. Right, those are supposed to be straight lines, but that's the best I can do with my mouse. Um, you know, this electric field 
uniform electric field is one way of looking at it. Um, the new way of looking at it is we've created this potential difference between here and there because it would, you know, a, a positive charge in here would feel compelled to move from here to there and would lose potential energy, would gain kinetic energy. So it has a change in potential um, over this region in space. So that's, that's one example. Another example is we saw this kind of, hey, we have a, an ugly sweater. See, this is an ugly sweater. And I take a balloon and let me make this a little bit larger, I hope. And I take the balloon and I rub it on the ugly sweater and I strip off some electrons. The electrons, I wind up with an abundance of negative charge on the balloon. I wind up with an abundance of positive charge because I've lost electrons on the ugly sweater. And with this, I've created a potential difference because I've separated charges. I've, I've changed the, the state from its natural harmony of balance between plus and minus to this imbalanced place. And in between this space, I've created a potential difference, okay? Um, another nice example of this is if I have, hopefully this is on your screen. I have all these zoom tools in front of it, but hopefully those aren't visible to you. Um, on, on your screen here, you see clouds. You have this frictional movement of the clouds against the, themselves. And it creates a little bit of a separation of charge because they're so massive, you get this massive, massive amount of separation of charge. And the tendency is for the negative charge to collect nearer to the bottom of the cloud and the positive to be collect near the top of the cloud. You know, you've, you've done this ionization of, of, the, of the, the cloud particles. So you have negative here, the earth, you're gonna get positive, you know, positive charge down here. And now you have this huge change in you know this huge separation of charge between here and there and you can you know this can lead to a, a tremendous flowing of current between these two these two places as we move into next you know next week one of the things that um i want to to examine closer is this idea of you know potential creating a flow of charge Right, and if I can get one last graphic up on the screen here, you know, um, a lot of you guys are biologists or going into medical practice or life sciences, things like this, things that I don't know very much about and I would love to learn more about, but I do know about potential and potential is one of these things that is incredibly important for life processes because if I look at a cell, and you measure the potential on either side of a cell membrane, you can get these millivolt level potential differences um, because of the separation of charges. And that can, you know, that can lead to all kinds of interesting biological processes, impelling or compelling charged particles to move through that potential, potential difference. So very abstract quantity, but it really is super important for all the things, you know, around us and for understanding even biological processes. Um, so, it, we have 940, I have 20, 20 minutes to go, so I think we're right about on track. So, my next question is, we have this idea of potential, and I hope that you are, um, you're getting some idea of of how this might be useful and what this idea even means. But how do we calculate it in the first place, right? We, we, we want to be able to, you know, figure out, I've created a, a separation of charge by either, you know, a storm cloud or putting charges on different parallel plate capacitors or something like that. How do I calculate the potential difference if I want to use this wonderful potential energy change um, formalism? Well, the first thing to do is, and this is why I wasted 20 minutes, not wasted, but kind of pounded into the ground for 20 minutes earlier in the lecture, that your potential equals zero can be anywhere convenient. So we choose the point where we want the potential equal to zero because we all we care about is differences in potential. So we just choose the most convenient point. And this is the analog of, you know, in gravitational potential energy, I set Y equals zero at the ground floor of the Merritt Hall as opposed to setting it, um, you know, at the top of the Eiffel Tower, you know, that would be very inconvenient. 
Um, so I choose, I choose the potential at a point which is convenient for me to do the calculations. And then I just calculate the work or the change in potential energy. That's you know two sides of the same coin. We talked about looking at the, the change in potential energy in these last couple of examples. That's really also looking at the, the work that's needed to move a positive test charge into that location. This idea of a positive test charge, I am gonna pause on this because it was also a part that blew me away when I was a student and um, I think is also difficult to understand as we go through here. But if you wanna read your book, you're gonna to have to get your head around this. You don't have to do anything, but if you want to, if you want to um, understand this, this is kind of very fundamental idea and it's a little bit slippery. Um, so I, I encourage you to, to, to focus some mental power on it for a moment, this idea of a positive test charge. So in order to get the potential, we're gonna calculate the work needed to move a positive test charge to the location that we're talking about. So let me, let me you know, try to change those, that word salad into, into a working example here. So we're gonna start with a parallel plate capacitor. And a parallel plate capacitor, we've seen, we've known, we've loved it for a couple of lectures now. The electric field of a parallel plate capacitor is one over epsilon naught, which epsilon naught is just some horrible number, 10 to the minus 12 something, something, somethings. And then the charge density or the Q over A, where A is the surface area of, of, the, um, of the capacitor. So Q is gonna be the value of charge that I put on here. Um, also equal, equal to the magnitude of charge that I put on this guy over here, the negative and A is the surface area of these parallel plates. Okay, so we've we figured that out before. I've created a separation of charge here by you know, putting plus on one and, and minus on the other, and that's gonna create this nice, beautiful, uniform electric field. That's the system that we are interested in. That's the system of charges that we are interested in, is this positive and negative plate. What is it doing to the space in between that plate? In order to figure this out, in my mind, not in reality, but in my mind, I, I try to figure out what would happen if I put a positive test charge, a little test charge. Why is it a test charge? Because it's so small that it's not going to change anything in the system. It's not going to realign the, how these charges in the parallel plate capacitor are sitting. It's so tiny that it, it just doesn't, it doesn't change the system at all. And in the end, I'm going to throw it away. It's not, actually, it's not actually part of the problem. I'm just going to use it to evaluate that system. That's a test charge. So I put this test charge in here in an initial situation. And then I'm going to think about what happens if I move it to some final position. And let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, I've introduced a x-axis down here. So my x-axis, it just goes from x equals 0 to wherever. Uh, for convenience, I'm putting x equals zero at the negative, um, at the negative parallel plate capacitor, the value here. And why do I do that? Because I'm also going to choose that as my zero for potential and potential energy. Okay. Again, because only differences in potential matter, um, I can choose that zero anywhere that I want. So I'm going to put it here at x equals zero. The other part of this, this isn't quite lined up because I'm a terrible drawer. But this x equals d is supposed to be the d is the spacing in between the two, two capacitor plates. It doesn't matter that value as long as it's small compared to the size of these plates. We want those plates to be very close together in order for this, this simple formula here to, to hold. Um, so in my cartoon here, this is a little bit exaggerated. You want to think, you know, just so that I can, I can actually draw something in between those plates but you wanna think about them being very, very close, close together. So the, the positive plate is at x equals d, and then any particular location in between those plates is at uh, just value x. So I start with this positive test charge. It's close to negative, the negative plate. It likes negative charges, so it wants to be attracted to that. In order to move it from left to right, I'm going to have to push it. I'm going to have to actually apply a force for it to get from this point to that point. It wants to get, it's attracted to those negative charges. It's repelled by those positive charges. 
So I have to apply a force in order to do this, to move it from left to right. The value of that force is just equal and opposite to the electrostatic force that's applied by the electric field in between here. This electric field, remember if I put a positive test charge in this region, it's going to be immersed in an electric field and it's gonna experience a force equal to QE. If I wanna move this charge from here to there, I have to overcome that force. And if I just wanna move it at constant velocity, I have to exactly balance that force. And that the value of that force is just gonna be Q times E. So that overcomes the force of the capacitor plates uh, is exerting on the charge. In that, I'm applying a force over a distance X. I am doing work. Go back to the first semester. That's our basic definition of work is force applied over a distance. So the work done on this poor little test charge is the force applied on it times the change in, um, in position. Now, going back to our decision in the beginning to set our zeros all over here, that simplifies these deltas because the initial u and the initial x are both zero. I didn't have to do that. I just did that for convenience. But that does simplify this down to u of x is equal to f times x because I've gotten rid of this and this. They're both equal to zero. Finally, I know, um, I know that q is, uh, or I'm sorry, I know that f is equal to qe. So just following this through, I get qe times x, just following through. And finally, because I know the value of e, because we looked at it last time, E equals Q over A divided by epsilon naught. Discriminating between these Qs, this Q is your source Q. It's the, it's the charge that's on the parallel plate capacitor. Um, whoops, went too far. Uh, so I finally get this slightly complicated equation here. U of X is equal to small Q, one over epsilon naught, Q over A, X, okay? So going back to the original definition of potential, Right, the very first thing that we, we reviewed today, U equals Q over V. If I wanna get that potential and I've just figured out the potential energy, all I gotta do is normalize out that Q. I gotta divide out that Q. Sorry if I'm scrolling too fast here and make you dizzy. Um, see the ugly sweater and the cloud again. And here we are back where we were, hopefully. So I normalize out that Q, and that's why I call it a test charge, because in the end, I just don't care about it. I throw it away. It was, a, it was kind of a calculational tool um, that we just we throw away when we get to the end. So we normalize that out, and I, now I have an expression for the potential at any region of space inside that parallel plate capacitor, and it's just one over epsilon naught, big Q over A times X, and I also could simplify this as um, the potential energy is equal uh, to the electric field times the position in inside. That's at any point inside this capacitor. If I, but normally when you talk about a, a, a parallel plate capacitor, you would talk about the entire potential difference uh, of this parallel plate capacitor. What, where is that, you know, where is that referring to? It's when you have gone all the way to x equals d from here to there. So I just substitute in that maximum x, which is d, and I get delta v equals e over d. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause here for a second. I'm gonna try to share something else with you guys. Um, you know, as we go, I'm trying to incorporate better, better, um, better technology as we go. And we have this second camera. So another way of writing, another way of writing this is, you know, delta V equals the electric field times D. And I could rearrange this as electric field is equal to the potential difference divided by the, the distance between. And we'll see that this is something that's, that's kind of quasi, you know, universal. We'll see that this relationship between electric field and potential. Once we have the potential difference, we can get the electric field from it. Okay, so I just wanted to test, see if that camera works. You guys see that camera? I hope. If not,
So, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it looks, yeah, but it's very choppy. We lost sound for a second there. Troy, can you hear me again? Choppy as in low frame rate. Camera looked good though. We can hear you now. I don't know what's going on. Whenever I switch to that weird other camera, I lose the audio and now I lost my video. So I'm not even sure if you can see me anymore. But anyway, that's technology for you. Um, hopefully, you know, the most important thing is with this last couple of minutes, can you still see my notes? You can still see the PDF of the notes. Thank you, Troy. Um, so that's that's the basic basic idea there of how you would calculate the potential. And then we're going to get into you know what I want you to do is not become maybe experts in calculating potential, but hopefully understanding where this idea comes from. And then we're going to see that that um, you know these potentials potential differences are are very are are very um, important in creating flows of current from one region of space to another and you'll have to you have to bear with me we'll get into that um, circuits fairly soon but one or two more lectures from now what I want to do just to finish this out is look at the the the, the potential of a point charge I'm not going to drive it with that was enough of a derivation for the parallel plate capacitor but the basic idea is the same I have a point charge that's creating this electric field, or it's creating a potential difference, two ways of thinking of this, the same thing, two, two ways of saying the same thing. It's creating a potential difference in the region of space around it. And I wanna think about what's the potential due to this point charge at this point R, that's some radius away from it. Um, and the way that I would calculate, the way that I would get this formula if I derived it for you, was I would think about, I would set my potential V equals zero, infinitely far away, very far away. Um, do you need to know the value of the test charge to calculate the potential? Great question, Francis. Um, no, nope, because we normalize it out in the end. It's just in, the, in your head, think of it as something very small. You could, you could give it you know, one nanocoulomb in your head and then you can throw it away, but the actual value of it is, has no significance. Thank you for the question, very good question. Um, so if we, if we think about that, that test charge and we started at V equals zero, which is in this, it's simplest to put that at infinity. And then I move that into this point in space, the work that would, the change in potential energy could be calculated. The work could be calculated in the same way that we just did. And I could get that potential from that process, which I'm not going to do for you guys. And I don't want you to be able to do for yourselves, but the answer is just uh, K Q over R. I want to show you this formula because this is the potential due to this point charge. This is our source charge. It creates a potential at this point in space. And if I wanted to calculate it, say for example, I had a 10 nanocoulomb charge here and one millimeter away, I would just put in the numbers. This is my coulombs constant, nine times 10 to the nine. My source charge is 10 nanocoulombs and it's one millimeter away. If I plug this in, I get 90,000 volts at this point in space. That's 90 kilovolts if I use the SI prefixes. Okay, so that's how you would figure out the potential due to a point charge. And what I'd like to just finish up here with is there's a symmetry of this problem. So anywhere along this radius, you would get the same exact number because nothing else changes in this formula. It just depends on this R. This R is always the same on this circle. So the, the symmetry of this problem tells me that the potential will be the same anywhere along this circle at some distance r from the source. And just to give this a fancy name, we call it an equipotential line. The last thing that I want to introduce, and we'll, we'll go over this a little bit more next time, is this idea of equipotential lines. If I calculated the potential at some radius, say one millimeter, I would get a a number for the potential at this radius. If I calculated at two millimeters, some other distance, I would get a different potential all along this constant line. And if I calculated it at, at some other radius, say three or four millimeters, all along that radial line, I would get the same number. We call these equipotential lines, and you can think of these as being similar 
if you're looking at a, a contour map um, of, of topography, it tells you like the elevation on a map. This is, this is kind of similar to that. It tells me the regions in space where the potential is all, um, all equal. The last part of this is what we'll find is that electric field lines are always going to be perpendicular to those equipotential lines. I'm hitting you with a lot of jargon in the last 30 seconds here, and we'll go over it again next time. But remember, for a point charge, you guys mastered this a couple times ago. What's the electric field of a point charge? It points out radially from that point charge in all directions. And notice it's just perpendicular to those equipotential lines everywhere there. Okay, with that, uh, we have a couple more minutes. I'm just gonna stop and allow you to ask me some questions um, or comments, anything, you know, suggestions of, of what we need to do here. Um, those of you, again, who are reading along at home, which I hope is all of you, uh, do read from 21.4 to 21.8 in the textbook. And hopefully by next time, the number of Zoom glitches will get less and less. Any questions from anybody out there? Okay, I'll just leave this open. Otherwise, have a great day, and I will again. We're gonna have we're gonna have lecture on Friday. It is not a group work Friday. This is a lecture Friday. So I'll see you on Friday. Thanks for coming today, and be safe out there.